I'm Jonathan Larson with TYT Investigates, and today we're going to be talking about the new statement from President Bush regarding the killing of George Floyd and the aftermath, the protests that we've seen and the response to the protests. And I'm going to go through some of the highlights, the things that I wanted to talk about, add some context if I can that's, that's hopefully helpful, if only to me. And then when I'm done, I want to lay down a few things that I guarantee you there will be something in there that you do not know, have not heard before. I'm going to do that at the end, both about Bush when he was president and Bush right now. So let's start with this statement by President George W. Bush. I'm going to jump around a little bit, so uh, don't, don't hold me accountable for the continuity. I'm warning you now, I'm jumping around. Laura and I are, ex are anguished by the brutal suffocation of George Floyd and disturbed by the injustice and fear that suffocate our country. Yet we have resisted the urge to speak out because this is not the time for us to lecture. That is true. That is true. The time for him to lecture was between 2001 and 2008 when he was the president of the United States of America. And I'll, I promise you, we're going to get to why that would have been a good time for him to say something. He says, it is time for us to listen. It is time for America to examine our tragic failures. That is also true. However, he does not do so and has not done so. So, you first, President Bush. It remains a shocking failure that many African Americans, especially young African American men, are harassed and threatened in their own country. It is a strength when protesters, protected by responsible law enforcement, march for a better future. Protected by responsible law enforcement. Why do protesters need protection? Why is it that George W. Bush seems to think that protesters, civil rights protesters, need protection by law enforcement? From whom? Who's attacking them other than law enforcement? This tragedy, in a long series of similar tragedies, raises a long overdue question. How do we end systemic racism in our society? Okay, the question is not overdue, all right? The answers, the implementation of the answers, those are what's long overdue. He says, the only way to see ourselves in a true light is to listen to the voices of so many who are hurting and grieving. Those who set out to silence those voices do not understand the meaning of America or how it becomes a better place. Those who set out to silence those voices. Now, who might those be? President those? President Donald J. those? It's one syllable, President Bush. You can handle saying the name Trump. He writes, the heroes of America, from Frederick Douglass to Harriet Tubman to Abraham Lincoln to Martin Luther King Jr., are heroes of unity. They're also heroes of history. They're all dead. The closest one to us, the closest one to this time, to this moment, to our place in history, is 50 years, more than 50 years away. They're all dead and gone. They are safe. They've been scrubbed clean, been sanctified for the white audience. So now, conservatives who were old enough to think poorly of Martin Luther King Jr. when he was alive, walk around celebrating MLK Day and talking about how he was. Which elides the fact that civil rights leaders of every generation are always held up to this incredible standard. Just like we have perfect victims, we demand perfect messengers, right? You're going to tell me MLK had problems? Well, we sent the FBI to find out, right? You're going to tell me FK, F, uh, MLK was imperfect, maybe in his marriage, right? So therefore he was a problem? Because that's what was being said at the time, or has been said, I don't remember exactly when it came out, but that's been said about him at the time. He was, I, I've gone back and looked at the interviews that he's done, long extended interviews on TV. He was hammered for his statements. And if you demand that, that our black leaders today be perfect, tell me about how Thomas Jefferson was perfect. Tell me about FDR and JFK, how they were perfect. Tell me about how Bill Clinton was perfect. They all get the monuments and the libraries, but if a black person today speaks out, well, let's, let's look at this, let's look at that. I actually wanted to come up with a list. I, I, uh, I came up with some names and I did it myself. I did my, I had that own instinct of, oh no, before I name this person, before I name that person, I've got to go Google and see whether there's some scandal surrounding them, right? That's a standard we don't hold anyone to. Reverend William Barber, Michelle Alexander, Doray McKesson, Patrice Cullors, 
Janetta Elzey. There's, there's lots of them out there today, right now. If you really want to make a difference, President George W. Bush, and you think we should be listening, why are you telling us to listen to people half a century dead? Referring to these heroes of America, the dead, safe heroes of America, he says, their calling has never been for the faint-hearted. Again, this is someone who's too faint-hearted to say the name of the president or to say the name of a black person who hasn't been dead for 50 years. He writes, many doubt the justice of our country and with good reason. Black people see the repeated violation of their rights without an urgent and adequate response from American institutions. We know that lasting justice will only come by peaceful means. Forget all of history, okay? Forget the entire 20th, uh, uh, everything uh, leading up to the 21st century of American history. Forget the fact that America itself did not come about through peaceful means. This is the man who invaded Iraq and Afghanistan to, in the pursuit of lasting justice. He then says, looting is not liberation and destruction is not pro progress. <laughs> Again, the perfect time for this, the perfect time for this would have been the eight years from January 2001 to uh, up through January of 2009. He has some feel-good blah, 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 and then he ends with, this will require a consistent, courageous, and creative effort. We serve our neighbors best when we try to understand their experience. We love our neighbors as ourselves when we treat them as equals in both protection and compassion. There is a better way, the way of empathy and shared commitment and bold action and a peace rooted in justice. I'm confident that together, Americans will choose the better way. So let's talk about the courageous effort that's required here. This is a guy who can't live up to even his own prescription, right? This is his own weak medicine that he's prescribing, and he can't even do that. He doesn't have, even have the courage to admit his own mistakes, to discuss them publicly. Like, go out and talk to someone who's not Ellen DeGeneres, right? Go out and actually be on camera. That would be a courageous and, a courageous and creative effort. Go out and be on camera talking with one of the black leaders of today who you won't name. And by the way, when you do that, have the courage to say the name of the current president. And in terms of his own failures, let's do some history. And this is the part where, look, I get it. Everyone's going to have their favorite. You, want, you think George Bush supports black people? What about this thing he did? And I'm, I'm not saying that the ones I'm about to go through are more important. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm saying these are ones that I recall being familiar with at the time that have been forgotten by history. And I recall being familiar with some of them because I actually broke one of these stories. Uh, and I, it, it's been so long forgotten that I had to go back and research it. Um, so I'm going to start with that. This, was, this is actually not my own reporting. This is other people talking about the stuff that I reported. Americans United for Separation of Church and State had a great uh, piece on this. In the first term of Bush's uh, presidency, his White House came up with a plan. They had something called the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives. Maybe you remember it. And they came up with a plan for how to use the office for political means. And we know this because the number two guy in the office, a guy named David Quo, who was a conservative evangelical. I spoke with him, I talked with him, and not on friendly terms. He was not happy with me. But this was a guy who was 100% earnest and sincere in his conservative ideology and his, his evangelical theology. That's why he was so upset. Here's what he writes. Excuse me, this is being still quoted by Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Quoting, quote, we lit from his book. And by the way, the, re the reason I broke the story was I got a copy of his book first and we reported it on Countdown with Keith Olbermann. He writes in his book, we laid out a plan whereby we would hold roundtable events for threatened incumbents. The roundtable events would be with faith and community leaders. They came up with a list of 20 House and Senate targets. In other words, they decided to hold these roundtables in districts or states where there were 20 GOP uh, races that they thought they could win, but they could use some help to get there. 
And what they did in these conferences, they were designed to um, uh, bring together faith leaders, but they all happened to be hosted not just by the leader of the Faith-Based Initiatives Office, but also by, you guessed it, the, the candidate who needed help. It's not part of their campaign. They're just here to help the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives make contact with the community. During the conferences, quote-unquote conferences, local, local clergy members were led to believe that they could qualify for significant government grants. A special outreach was made to African American clergy. So let's, let's dilute this a minute, right? They created the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives, which was a fraud. David Quo exposed it for a fraud. It was a fraud both because it was solving a problem that wasn't real. There was no significant discrimination against uh, faith-based charities. So there was no need for a special office to give them money. So they used that fake office for explicitly political purposes. And to achieve their political purposes, they bamboozled black churches. They specifically decided to target black churches where they thought they could move people based on their faith. This is the height of a confidence scheme. This is an absolutely depraved scheme, right? You are targeting a disenfranchised population and using their religious faith to sucker them in. Out of those 20 targeted candidates, 19 won. Quo writes that in 2004, quote, sorry, sorry, Quo writes, quote, more than a dozen conferences with more than 20,000 faith and community leaders were held in 2003 and 2004 in every significant battleground state, including two in Florida, one in Miami, 10 days before the 2004 election. Their political power was incalculable. Here's what else the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives did. The Bush Office of Faith-Based Initiatives did. They specifically told faith leaders, especially black faith leaders, that they were going to give them funding. New funding, right? Because that was the scam. The scam was the Democrats deprived you of, of money because they hate God and they hate you for being Christian. That was the scam. So to, to carry out the scam, you had to tell people that they were getting new funds. Here's Quo, here's a, a summary of Quo talking about a meeting inside the, the White House. President George W. Bush, eager to show a visiting group of black pastors what he had done for them, demanded to know, not from the pastors, from his own staff, demanded to know how much money religious groups had been given under the initiative. In other words, He's getting ready for his meeting with black pastors, and he's saying, give me a number. Let me know what the number is that I can tell these black people who are here because of their role as faith leaders, I can tell them what we did for them. David Quo gave him a low figure. Bush balked, and Rove said $8 billion. Quo pointed out that those funds were available theoretically, in other words, already, at which point Bush interjected, quote, eight billion in new dollars? Quo replied, quote, no, sir, eight billion in existing dollars for which groups will find it technically easier to apply. In other words, all they had did, all they had done was basically make it easier, the application process easier. But the money had already been there and most faith groups already knew how to get it. They had already mastered the bureaucracy for getting it. So Quo says, $8 billion, in $8 billion in existing dollars for which groups will find it technically easier to apply, but faith-based groups have been getting that money for years. Unfazed, Bush responded, quote, $8 billion. That's what we'll tell them, them being black religious leaders. Sorry, guys, hold on one sec, even if I'm a little crooked. Okay, so... Bush responds that he will tell the black religious leaders eight billion. That's what we'll tell them. Eight billion in new funds for faith-based groups. Okay, let's go. Off to the meeting to lie to the black church leaders. Bush duly went forth, told the ministers about the eight billion dollars that was available and departed. The Chronicle of Higher Education also wrote about this stuff. 
thing, the, the purpose of these conferences that they set up was to teach black and Latino congregations how they too could get a share of the federal largesse. Reflecting on one particularly well-attended seminar in Atlanta, Quo laments the odds, quoting Quo, quote, maybe one out of the 500 people in the room, unquote, would actually receive a grant from this con. And it worked, by the way. Bush's office, Bush's lies, specifically designed to make black people happy and to use their religion to bamboozle them. According to the Chronicle of Higher Education, the African-American vote in Ohio went from 9% for Bush in 2000 to 16% in 2004, Ohio being one of the areas that was targeted. Here's a little bit more history from uh, the Bush White House. If you've never heard of the uh, U.S. Attorney's scandal, uh, it took place in 2006. It started to come out in force in 2007. Essentially, a batch of U.S. attorneys were fired by the Bush White House. And there was a big mystery about why that was. I'm going to read from the Washington Post back in 2007. Of the 12 U.S. attorneys, and by the way, U.S. attorney is the top federal prosecutor for, the, for their district. Some states are small enough that the entire state is just one district. A couple states, it's two districts. You might have the Northern District of Indiana, that kind of thing. So these are very powerful federal prosecutors. These are the top federal uh, prosecutors in each state. Of the 12 U.S. attorneys known to have been dismissed or considered for removal last year, five were identified by Karl Rove or other administration officials as working in districts that were trouble spots for voter fraud. In short, the U.S. Uh, Justice Department, in conjunction with the White House, decided that voter fraud was a problem, and then they pressured federal prosecutors to go prosecute voter fraud, to make it look like voter fraud was a problem. And a lot of these guys said no. They said go take a hike, and so they got fired. Now, what is the purpose of saying voter fraud is a problem, right? I'm guessing pretty much everyone who watches this already knows that, vote, that cracking down on voter fraud never in the history of our country has had the impact of significantly reducing the incidence of voter, voter fraud, which is insignificant. What it has done, those measures that make it harder to vote, the effect of that has been to make it harder for black people and other disenfranchised people to vote. That is what happens when you get a voter fraud crackdown. You make it tougher for people who tend to vote Democratic to vote. Disproportionately poor people, disproportionately black people, disproportionately other people of color. That's what the Bush administration did. The Justice Department demanded that one U.S. attorney, Todd P. Graves of Kansas City, resign in January 2006, several months after he refused to sign off on a justice lawsuit involving the state's voter rolls. And these were primarily people that Bush himself had appointed. That's how bad it was. Bush appointees said, this is out of line. So you know what? They got bounced. Why? Because they wouldn't go rob black people of their vote. Under the Bush administration, by Bush's, literally his top political guy, Karl Rove. U.S. Attorney Stephen M. Biskupic of Milwaukee also was targeted last fall after complaints from Rove that he was not doing enough about voter fraud. Starting early in the Bush administration, the Justice Department has emphasized increasing prosecutions of fraudulent voting. The White House, including President Bush himself, passed along complaints to Gonzalez, Alberto Gonzalez, his attorney general at the time, about alleged voting irregularities in Milwaukee, Philadelphia, and New Mexico, where prosecutor David C. Iglesias was fired. So that's President Bush himself, personally, helping to disenfranchise black voters in Milwaukee, Philadelphia, and New Mexico. White House officials also criticized John McKay, the U.S. attorney in Seattle at the time, for not pursuing an investigation after the disputed 2004 gubernatorial ele election in that state. McKay, who was fired, has said that the claim about um, voter fraud in the election has said that the claim was baseless. Of course it was baseless. That's why they were trying to create a base for us. So let's fast forward to President Bush today. And I promise then I'm going to shut up and listen to what you guys have to say. So what is President Bush doing today for the cause that he just championed, allegedly, sort of, kind of, right? 
This is his big statement, his bold, courageous statement in which he can't say the names of anyone bad today or anyone good from, from today either. The only good people he can name have been dead for 50 years. So here's what we know, what we know about President Bush today. You probably know that President Bush helped get Brett Kavanaugh confirmed to the Supreme Court. What I did was I went and looked up who he's giving money to since Trump got elected. It is a long list here, and this is an incomplete list. I didn't print out, this is I think just from Midland. I didn't print out all the ones from Dallas. He filed from multiple addresses. Jeff Flake, Roger Wicker, uh, McSally in Arizona, Rick Scott for Florida, Pete Sessions for Congress, uh, the Colorado Republican Committee, Josh Hawley, Mike Braun, Roger Williams for, uh, um, uh, Representative Roger Williams in Texas, a Trump guy, uh, Senator Dan Sullivan in Alaska, who has rubber stamped every single cabinet member and um, voted to acquit President Trump, got into office, kept his office with help from President Bush. Um, uh, Susan Collins has gotten, by my reckoning, uh, $11,200, if I got the math right, um, from President Bush. Uh, Trump's doctor, Ronnie Jackson, now running for congressman in Texas, is out there pushing Obamagate as a real thing. Got $1,000 from President George W. Bush on December 18th, 2019. Susan Collins in Maine. Uh, $5,600. Kay Granger, who votes for Trump 97% of the time in Texas, she got $5,600 from George W. Bush on February 12th, 2020. Um, February 28th, Genevieve Collins for Texas, uh, uh, who would replace a Democratic um, uh, representative in Congress, is a Trump supporter. So. While President Bush is talking about those who would silence, excuse me, those who set out to silence those voices of black people, he's also with his checkbook helping to elect people who would silence them, the very people he's talking about. And the one I forgot was John Cornyn, senator from Texas, who defended the photo op which the White House achieved by by using force to clean out religious people from their church and to move peaceful protesters out of the way using military-grade weaponry and federal uh, forces. $5,400 from George W. Bush. So, I got a lot of heat on Twitter. Well, not a lot. I got one, I got one tweet. It just felt like a lot because I generally liked the guy and he was all up at me. Um, I've said that if George W. Bush wants to be treated as a friend of the people he's suggesting he's a friend to, not just black people, but allies, then, then say you support Joe Biden, right? Do a video. Go make calls for Joe Biden. And by the way, do it for every other Democrat because all the people you, President George W. Bush, are helping, they're the ones making possible the things that you say are not American, which means you are too. All right, let's see what you guys have to say. If I can find the starting point and stick with you guys. Uh, D. Scully kicked in two bucks. Thank you so much, D. Scully. Um, I don't know if you folks know this, but in the super chat, you, uh, you, can, you can contribute to help us do what we do. And D. Scully just did that, and I'm very grateful. And, and I should add, as I always try to do, that if you can't afford it, if you can't afford it, Please don't feel like you're not supporting us. Watching supports us, liking us, literally clicking on the like button, uh, sharing our content, all of that helps us as well. It helps us to reach people. And frankly, this is a capitalist society, so that stupid which are probably for Trump anyway. Um, but you know, it helps more people see our ads, it helps us do the work that we do. Okay, um, so thank you for that, D. Scully. The squad plus one point, uh, refers to no child left behind. This was Bush's education initiative. Set kids up to fail. Escalation of the war on drugs. Set kids up to fail. Absolutely. Like I said at the top, there's, there's a whole catalog, right? There's an entire catalog of, 
of things that Bush did or kept in place that are part of the systemic grinding down of black people and other disenfranchised people. Right? I didn't even mention the entire thing of trying to get uh, anti-gay rights initiatives put on ballots as referendums to, to gin up support for President Bush in the, at the polls. The Squad Plus One says Bush is responsible for 9-11. Where was our protection? And just to be clear, I think the, the, we're not saying that Bush carried it out. He just failed to, to protect the country, which is 100% uncontroversial. Um, D. Scully says, Jonathan is going to get us addicted to his rants. I was very nervous that today wouldn't count as a rant, so I don't know whether it did or not, but um, I'm, I'm doing my best, guys. Jonathan is going to get us addicted to his rants, and he'll have to do it every day. This is quite a commitment he's making here. Pace yourself, Jonathan. Um, Uh, Weena Jensen says how comfortable it is to moralize and use beautiful words, and then there's a typo I think that I can't make uh, make uh, make out. Um, the squad plus one says I'm good with ranting. Um, ha ha ha! D Scully says, wait, is he feistier since getting his hair cut? Wait, is this the real JL? Is it an imposter? So just to be clear, I did not get a haircut. I just literally took the buzz thing and did the buzz thing. Um, my whole point was that I don't, I, I wanted to show solidarity with people who can't get haircuts and they're worried about how they look. I'm like, oh, this is okay, it's fine. Okay. Dave C says, governors should use the state and national guard to protect protesters from the police when necessary, but they won't. <laughs> Francis Wolf says, oh, hell yes, JL, excellent. Gear Brown says, Jonathan has found his voice. Maybe he'll run for something. God help us all. Uh, Kate Graves, thank you though for the kind words, guys. Uh, Kate Graves Johnson says, violent, messy roads to change are an American tradition. Sometimes you just have to figuratively burn it all to the ground. Um, the Squad Plus One says, Eisenhower put God on the buck and in the pledge. That's how long this crap has been going on. Yeah, so, so, Folks, if you don't know this history, our founding fathers were so atheistic, or deistic, if you want to get technically correct, right? Deism meaning they thought there was something going on, but they openly did not believe in a, a specific deity with intentionality and thought. There was special creative force to the universe, and that's what they meant by deism. So we didn't have a history of God in our founding documents, and our laws, and then in the, in the mid 20th century, mostly in response to communism, right? Uh, and the fear of communism, they added, they added in God we trust to our money and uh, whatever the under God, one nation under God, they added under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. These are not American things. These are literally un-American things that were injected by force into our DNA. And the reason history matters is so that we can recognize what's artificial and why. Why is it there? What purpose does it serve? Who does it serve? What damage does it do? Why was it not chosen at the outset? Weena Jensen says, Bush can't possibly have been the brain behind that scheme. He must have had some pretty sharp knives around him to orchestrate this. Lemon Lime says, I literally never would have read this statement from your perspective, and I'm so glad I watched this video. Thank you so much, Lemon Lime. I have to admit, my first impulse when I saw that he had a statement out was just to say, basically, you know, see ya. And, and I, don't know what, I don't know what made me go look at it, but uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad it had some use. And I, I, I think... I don't think my intention here is to say, no, you don't get to be an ally. For one thing, I don't get to make that decision. I guess what I'm trying to articulate here isn't even that he's bad or that he's racist, but that if you actually want to be a voice in this, you don't get to be a one-way voice, right? 
if you actually want people to listen to you and despite high-minded words at the start of, of your statement about this is not the time to lecture, that's exactly what you do here, right? If this isn't the time to lecture, what you could have done in your statement was said, this is not the time to lecture, and then said, so I won't, and then include quotes from um, black leaders, right, of today, living ones, imperfect messengers, right, elevate them. But if you're not going to do that, if you are going to lecture, then at least have the courage, you called for courage, get out there, be answerable for this. And if you really want people to start examining our tragic failures, do it, right? We've seen white politicians who've been able to say, you know what, the, the crime bill in the 90s, that was a mistake. And that's good, that was good. It's not enough. We haven't done the unpacking of why did it happen? What led you to make that mistake if it wasn't hatred or fear of black people, and I think it probably was not in some cases, what was it, right? If it's a, a mindless or a fearful embrace of militarism and a police mentality, then let's talk about that. Let's talk about, let's get into the roots of it and have the conversation. But don't tell me we have to have a conversation, but you won't participate. And if you won't participate, then, then yes, I would argue, you don't get to be in the, ally, uh, the pantheon of allies. Anyway, thank you, Lemon Lime. Um, D. Scully says, because separation of church and state isn't discrimination, it's necessary to have a democracy rather than theocracy. Nobody's stopping the private practice of religion. Their entire argument was bogus. And by the way, you know, this is not a terribly original point, but the guy just used force to clear religious people out of their own church. Where, where, are, the, where are the militias that I was told were going to protect uh, God in this country, right? Dave C. says, at least the Republicans actually reach out, unlike the Democrats who shame you or tell you to vote for another candidate. So Dave, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what you mean there. Can you, can you flesh that out a little bit? And hopefully I'll get to you before, before I run out of wind or, or steam. I'm trying to go on renewable energies, right? It's wind and steam. Um, okay. Uh, Lemon Lime says, oh, I love when JL claps and rubs his hands together because he's about to really lay into someone. I didn't even know I did that. Did I really do that today? Um, Francis Wolf says, uh, gosh, it's so cool. I like TYT Investigates is so cool. We get to revel in the mind of the investigators. I hope one day one of y'all will write about our history, our history of wickedness in South America. Oh, South America you're talking about. Uh, thank you for that, Francis. Um, let's see. All right. Sorry, guys. I got to ban a troll here. All right. Let's see. Um... The squad, one, uh, the squad Plus One points out that Twitter closed an account that was set up by white supremacists that uh, identified itself as anti-fascist, Antifa or Antifa, however you want to say it. Uh, Weena Jensen says, I nearly died when I found out the other day that Karl Rove is still very much active in politics. You think that one horrible era is replaced by something else only to realize how inbred it all is. Sorry guys, hold on. Doing a little bit of um, troll policing. Nonviolent, by the way, nonviolent. And by the way, I'm not silencing your free speech either, right? You can go talk wherever you want. That's that's not here. This is this is my place, okay? Uh, and I don't have to share your comments on my 
page, just like the New York Times doesn't have to share Tom Cotton's comments on their page. All right, guys, sorry. I'm catching up to you, I swear. The Squad Plus One says the people protesting are stopping anyone they see starting trouble or suggesting violence and looting. There's plenty of videos out there of protesters doing exactly that, stopping people, turning them over to the police. Um, Jared Brown says, JL, I have a feeling you wrote or co-wrote some of Keith Olbermann's G.D. Bush comments. Um, so I'm not sure exactly which comments you're talking about. He did, he did those special comments, which were these extended, usually historic, uh, historic meaning they relied a lot on history, um, explanations about issues, I, I wrote a chunk of stuff that ended up in one of them, but those were all Keith. I did, I did end up, I did work for Keith for five and a half years. So yeah, pretty much any night you watched Countdown, you were, you were hearing stuff that I wrote. Um, Sorry guys, I'm trying to uh, figure out what some of you are talking about before I share it. Uh, Solex X says, what does Bush have to do with anything? This is ancient history. We know they're all corrupt. Bush is a fossil fuel war criminal. So the reason Bush has anything to do with anything is because he's the closest thing to an alternative leader that the Republican Party has right now. And he is trying in his own weak, pathetic way to be a voice of reason to rein in uh, the forces of authoritarianism that we see unleashed in the streets right now, which he helped unleash. So I would argue that both in terms of the current discourse, right, a lot of, a lot of political thinkers and all of that, they think it's important that Bush has had something to say. But even if he had nothing to say, it's crazy to ignore the role that Bush played in getting us here. And by the way, this isn't a partisan thing. It's really important to examine the role that Clinton and Obama played in getting us here, right? They helped militarize our police. They helped instill this order, this fetish for order, right? Obama didn't dismantle the Department of Homeland Security. We still have this infantile agency that basically is the Bureau of Please Keep Me Safe, right? So all of them, it's important to understand the history so we know how we got here. In theory, that should remind us, A, that we've been somewhere else, right? It doesn't have to be that way, this way. We know it doesn't have to be this way if we know the history, which tells us it wasn't always this way. We can go, oh, that's what it used to be like, and that's why it changed. That gives us the power to change it back, to remind ourselves we weren't like this. We don't have to be like this. And the reasons we are like this are really bad. So let's choose not to be like this. But first we have to understand what are we like now? And that depends on going back and figuring out how we became this way. Francis Wolf says, people should know who Abrams and Bolton are. My husband was an airborne ranger in the 80s. He never came back. A, disillusion, a disillusioned, disillusioned robot came back. This is about both bushes. Sorry about that, Francis. Thank you for sharing that. And yeah, it certainly goes back to both bushes, Reagan, D. Scully says, the faux resistance is only upset with Trump because he is graceless. None are against his policies and have often helped to get us to this point. I, it, it's amazing the number of people out there who are basically just like, ooh, could use a little more polish. Uh, D. Scully answers a question about a situation I confess I'm not familiar with, if anyone has an answer. Maybe you could post it in the chat or the comments. Mighty Mouse uh, has a quote here. I don't fight fascism because I think I can win. I fight fascism because it is fascism.
Gary Brown says something similar. We fight evil because it's evil and it's there. Dave C. chimes in. Bush also helped pass legislation, I assume you mean signed into, uh, signed into law, legislation to reward law enforcement for drug arrests with funding. Those arrests disproportionately affect people of color. Like I said, there's a whole catalog out there, and, and I, I may not read them all, but I hope people will continue to contribute them in the chat and in the comments. Weena Jensen says, Jonathan, it was your investigative DNA that caused you to dig into the context of Bush's statement. Well, to be honest, I, thank you thank you for that, Weena. I was, I was just curious. It struck me like, wait, is he, because I've been out there saying you should endorse Biden. And then it just occurred to me, well, where's, where's your money going, Bush? It's tens of thousands, if not more, of dollars to support the people who are enabling Trump right now. They're too faint-hearted to stand up to Trump, and Bush is too faint-hearted to call them out for it. And he's going to tell us... What exactly was it he said? This guy. The heroes of America, their calling has never been for the faint-hearted. You know what? That's a fantastic way to confess that you are not one of the heroes of America. And by the way, if you're the president of the United States of America, and you're not a hero of it, then you're pretty freaking close to a villain. And, and I'm not saying that everything else he did didn't already qualify him for that status. I'm just saying that alone. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, let's see. Weena Jensen says, Jonathan, do you think that Bush actually understands how this looks? I do. I do think um, he understands how it looks. And I think that's why he wrote it the way he did. It looks pretty good to most of the people who, who dominate our discourse. That's why he wrote it this way. Because most of the folks out there are not going to call him out on the elisions, Eli elisions that he's made. They're not going to call him out for what he hasn't said. They're not going to call him out for, for the, the confessions of his own that he has yet to make. So, yeah, I think he absolutely understood how it looked. And I think he probably had help with how it looks from probably some of the same people who helped him carry it out when he was in power as well. Okay, so, um, oh, D. Scully points out that uh, uh, their question earlier about whether the Assembly Center people had water, the Assembly Center was where George W. Bush abandoned, abandoned people after Katrina and, the, and patted uh, Michael Brown, the head of FEMA at the time, patted him on the, bra on the back saying, heck of a job, Brownie. If you're not familiar with it, go, uh, go check out the quote. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm going to take off. I'm going to wish you all a good weekend. Uh, I don't know if you saw, but I went to a protest in Jersey City the other day. Um, some of the video is up from that on our YouTube channel, so I hope you'll go check that out. Uh, all of it is up on Facebook. Some of it I did live, so I hope you'll go check out our Facebook page as well. If you don't already, please subscribe. I'm working on, on um, a new story uh, T. Wa Chang, our investigative reporter, he's working on a, a story. We, we're, we're all doing this. We're both doing this. Thanks to your support. Um, if you subscribe, that helps us. If you watch our videos and share them, that helps us. Uh, and the more you help us do that, the more we can actually focus on the investigative work. All right. So um, I guess I'm asking you to please take care of us as well as please take care of yourselves and please take care of each other. And uh, have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week because we're going to be back. We're not going anywhere. Bye.